Hi everyone, I am Salma Dair, economist for SDSN. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. This webinar was organized to launch a new study uh, produced by the University of Sydney, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network and the Deutsche Gesellschaft für International Sources Menerbeit, excuse my accent, GIZ, on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. It is called Making Globalization and Trade Work for People and Planet, International Spillovers Embodied in the European Union's Food Supply Chains. This event will bring together practitioners and experts to discuss the issue of international spillovers embodied in trade and consumption in the context of Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the Paris Climate Change Agreement. We're glad you're here. First of all, I would especially like to thank our moderators and panelists. We greatly appreciate your participation in this webinar. Before we begin, I wanted to share a few points about logistics. First off, if you are having any technical issues following this discussion today, please share them via chat and select all panelists. And someone from our team will try to help you. We ask for your patience. Uh, second, we invite you to participate to our discussion as much as you want by sharing any questions or comments you have with the panelists via the Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box. Please let us know your name and organization with your question. We will select them and then uh, transfer them to our panelists. Finally, I would like to inform you uh, that this webinar will be recorded. We are now 87 people attending. Um, so now let's, let us start the webinar. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Ingolf Dietrich, a director of the 2030 Agenda, expert on different topics like poverty, democracy, rule of law, equality, human rights, and education, commissioner for sustainable development for the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, for the welcoming remarks. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, moderator. Mr. Lafortune, Dr. Malik, dear colleagues and dear audience. I'm especially thankful to SDSN and GIZ for organizing this event on, on this important uh, topic of international spillover effects in achieving the SDGs. And I'm also thankful for the invitation to speak on, on this event. You may know the concept of sustainable development expressed through the 2030 agenda and the 17 SDGs is a key principle of the work of the German government and my ministry, the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ. It serves as our compass and our guiding framework for our development policy. Since the Russian attack on Ukraine on 24th of February, two of the world most important exporters of cereals, it's about 20%, are in war. The war in Ukraine will have effects on food security worldwide. Current trends show it will limit food, world's food supply, resulting in the skyrocketing of food prices and hunger. It will jeopardize food um, <clears throat> security in many countries uh, like Egypt, Indonesia, Bangladesh, they are among the most important importers of cereals of uh, the two countries. Egypt, for example, is importing 80% from the two countries. The people in the global south will be the ones who suffer se severely, and it's our responsibility to face the problem. Today's world uh, is highly globalized. The countries are interlinked, similar like the 17 SDGs, and actions of one country can affect another country positively and negatively. Such international spillovers are linked to many fields like the greenhouse gas emissions, financial flows, demand of uh, certain, maybe sometimes polluting commodities, labor standards and general production consumption correlations. Over the past years, German politics increasingly takes spillover effects into account. However, SDG monitoring generally looks good for countries in the global north, as they are uh, passing many difficult problems on to developing countries. 
the so-called footprint is an expression of that. Consumption in the north can have negative effects on the south. This aspect is not a small statistical detail, but a blind spot and does not always reflect the reality when essential, essential information is missing. Fortunately, and thanks to the impressive work of uh, the partners here, there is the powerful tool of spillover analyze. By analyzing flows of materials and money of uh, geophysical interactions and uh, other factors between countries, spillover analyze can give us a much clearer picture of reality when using it to complement conventional SDG ratings. Measuring these spillover effects is a powerful tool in the SDG implementation, and it's also powerful to make informed policy decisions and concerning resource allocation and priority setting. Only if such negative spillovers across countries are managed carefully, the promise of the 2030 agenda can be fulfilled, particularly since negative effects trend tend to flow from rich to poor countries. BMZ has been partnering with uh, SDSN since 2013 to strengthen the role of science in general in policymaking and uh, on the topic of spillover effects in particular. Today's topic is another example of our good collaboration of the last years. It brings together the study of global spillovers and food supply chains as a real life issue affecting people all over the world, like I mentioned before. Especially against that background uh, of this uh, developments in Ukraine, sustainable food supply, ch supply chains and food security must be given high priority attention. And with this important uh, and global topic in mind, I would like to thank again SDSN and GIZ for their ambitious work on the spillover effects uh, for our and, and for our good cooperation in the last years. And this closing, I wish everyone in the audience an inspiring uh, or inspiring and new insights into the new, uh, the important research on spillovers. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I will now leave the floor to my colleague, Zach Wendling, program manager for the Global Common Stewardship Index at SDSN, who will be moderating the panel discussion. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Hello. We're delighted to welcome you to this webinar on study of EU food supply chain spillovers. And for this discussion, we're pleased to welcome two lead authors of the study. We'll start with Guillaume Lafortune, the Vice President and Director of the Paris Office of SDSN. Guillaume, hello, and thank you for accepting our invitation. You have the floor for 15 minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Salma, Zach, and thank you, Dr. Dietrich, also for setting the scene so well um, for this webinar um, today but also for the continued support from the German government um, to document and work on this issue of internal, international spillovers in the context of um, the SDGs and, and Agenda 2030. So a major thank you to the BMZ, to GIZ for supporting our work um, throughout the years, and also to our co-author here, Arunima at the University of Sydney, who are doing phenomenal, phenomenal work in putting numbers around those, um, those issues. I concur completely with Dr. Dietrich um, in the sense that it's hard to host today a, a workshop on spillovers from the soup food supply chains without making the connection with what's going on um, in Eastern Europe. Obviously, you know, what's going on is a major setback for the, for the SDGs, a major distraction from medium and longer term um, goals, but it also has very direct um, impacts and implications on food prices, um, prices of fertilizers, and um, issues like undernutrition um, uh, as well. And, you know, Ukraine at the end of the day is the second uh, biggest country in Europe. Um, more than two thirds of the country's land surpasses under agriculture. And it has some of the most fertile soils in, in the world and, and also very favorable weather um, conditions. So. As it was mentioned by Dr. Dietrich, um, this has major implications. The disruptions in the, in the Black Sea um, area have major implications on 
wheat exports, bi barley and fertilizers, uh, crude sunflower oil and other food commodities around the world. A country like Eritrea, for instance, um, sources entirely its wheat imports from Russia and Ukraine, 100%. Lebanon, it's 60%, for instance. And many countries in Europe, obviously, the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa will be um, impacted what, by what is going on in a context where food prices have been rising already during um, COVID-19. So I, the FAO just released an estimate this year, which is very connected to our work at SDSN on, on the SDGs and estimates that uh, undernourished people could increase by 13.1 uh, million uh, people through this crisis, which is another major blow on SDG2, which calls for you know, addressing issues around hunger, um, diets, malnutrition, and sustainable agriculture which was a goal already in SDSN's work, where, which we identify as one of the goals which since 2015 and even before the COVID-19 pandemic was not going in the right direction in many parts of the world due to rising undernutrition, but also rising obesity rates and unsustainable um, diets. And with these disruptions to food supply chains, then it might generate some self-reinforcing social instabilities um, as well, again, in a context where food prices were already high um, before. So there might be trickling down effect on other SDGs um, as well. So from an SDG perspective, this is obviously a major humanitarian um, crisis. It has impact on food security. And it's also a major distractions for medium and long-term um, goals, objectives, and plans. Um, policies are refocusing on the immediate short um, run, and it's not always clear whether the short run policies um, are fully aligned with longer term structural um, direction, which are called for in the, in the SDGs. So, you know, if we needed one, this is a reminder that peace is an absolute prerequisite for making any progress on the SDGs. And to circle back to the to topic of um, today, obviously COVID-19 and global security uh, issues have direct impacts on food production prices and trade. But it's also a reminder that the more you know, silent, but also dire consequences of climate, climate change, soil erosion, and damages to the global commons that stem from unsustainable production and co consumptions will have on issues like access to food and uh, resources. And this is what our study focuses on today, which is on how the EU is contributing to climate change and harming trees, plants, and soil abroad through imports of food um, commodities. And how can the EU play a leadership role in uh, promoting sustainable um, supply chains? This is, of course, not an anti-trade um, call, but rather a call for making Green Deal, SDG diplomacy, the central pillar of the EU's foreign actions and, and partnerships uh, moving forward. So what I'll do in the next couple of minutes, um, and sorry, Zach, I might be a little bit longer than, than 15 minutes, but, but not too much longer. Um, I'll walk you through and, and put into a, a bit of context this study on the food supply chains, um, linking it to the SDGs and, and to the, the measurement work that we have been doing. And then I'll hand it over to Arunima, which will really deep dive into the methods um, and the findings of the, of the study. Um, so I'll be sharing my, my screen, um, which I hope you should be able to see now. Um, so at SDSN, we've been tracking since 2015 the performance of all UN member states on the 17 SDGs. And we've put at the center um, of this work, um, this issue of international spillovers. International spillovers are incorporated within our SDG index and dashboard series of reports. So we have a global edition, which comes out in June every year. And then we also do a special edition for, for Europe. The latest one came out in um, last uh, December. And so maybe to connect a little bit with what Dr. Dietrich was saying right, uh, right before, it is true that from a global standpoint, um, European countries stand out as the countries that perform best when it comes to sustainable development, but also another um, assessment made by the SDSN, the World Happiness um, Report. And actually, the 2022 edition of the World Happiness Report is coming out um, tomorrow. And so if you look at the top 10 
countries on both indices, the SDG index and World Happiness Report, we can see here that a majority uh, of them are European countries and many are actually EU um, countries. And you know, I think this is, you have to recognize that the, the European model of social democracy um, seems rather conducive to sustainable development and um, happiness. Now, having said that, there is one area which we have flagged over the years as problematic um, for Europe and, and the EU as a whole, is this issue of internal, international spillovers, and in particular, those that are embodied into consumption and trade, right? So it's one thing to, for instance, decarbonize domestically, but this is if this is achieved by outsourcing key sectors like cement or steel, and then re-importing the production, the SDGs being a global responsibility, um, this is not um, this is not acceptable and needs to be tracked. And so, um, on the you know, in addition to the SDG index, we do this international spillover index, and we see here that many European countries are actually among the worst performers um, in the world. Right. Um, and so that's that was the static picture of you know according to the latest data that we have, how European countries are doing. But even if we look in terms of trends over time, what this graph, which comes from the European uh, Sustainable Development Report released last December shows is that these are growth rates and these are CO2 emissions. Um, and the two blue lines, the, the, the dark blue line is the domestic CO2 emissions and the light blue lines are the imported CO2 emissions, right? So CO2 emissions, that are emitted abroad for satisfying the consumption of European citizens. And while you can see sort of a structural trend towards a decline in domestic emissions in, in, in the EU, um, although we could always say that the decline is not going um, uh, fast enough and there's you know, variations across countries, it's hard to see the same structural trend when we look at imported CO2 emissions. Actually, according to the latest data that we had at the time of publication, there was a, an increase in imported CO2 emission in 2017 and 2018, which was largely due actually to a volume effect, uh, an increase in the volume of, um, of imports. Um, these are three year moving averages. So, you know, on one hand, we do see some progress on the domestic side, even though I think there's a lot of study that shows that things are not moving fast enough. But from a spillover dimension, we don't see a clear trend toward a reduction of the impacts that are being generated, at least on CO2 emissions in the rest of the world through EU's um, consumption. So at DSDSN, we've been advocating for years that um, the SDGs call for six um, major transformations. And, Today, the study that we are presenting focuses on one of those six transformations, which is sustainable food, land, water, and, and, and oceans, so transformation um, four here, which is probably one of the most complex um, transformation uh, of, of all. Um, and so when we polled what I would say the SDG community back in um, 2020, and we made a, a global survey asking, you know, how um, do people perceive government efforts and actions to implement the six transformations? Transformation four was one of the transformations where um, the, um, the respondents flagged that they were seeing the least uh, progress um, compared with um, other, um, other transformation. And this aligns with some of the points I was saying or, uh, with our SDG index, which shows that the trends on SDG two, for instance, was not necessarily going in the right direction, but also when we look at issues like biodiversity threats, uh, marine and terrestrial, this is also a goal which we have been flagging at SDSN as um, not, not moving in the right uh, direction. And obviously there's major international reports that are also pointing at those, those issues. We at SDSN and working with many partners, including the Food and Land Use Coalition, are, are doing a lot of work on this issue on, on, on food and, and land. Um, so um, through FELD, we're tracking policies um, and actions on uh, food land transformation. There's modeling work being done by our FABLE team um, and, and pathways to sustainable land use. And more specifically, also on aligning the reporting and actions of businesses um, in the food supply chains to the to the SDGs. And so today's study is part of this, you know, broader work that is going on at, at this DSN on spillovers and food and land. And basically, what the main objective of the study, and Abunima will will dive into the results in a second, but is to put precise numbers on those spillover effects. 
right? So it's one thing to say the EU is generating impacts uh, abroad, um, but with precise numbers, um, it's easier to advocate for, for action. And so last year we documented, for instance, the fact that through textile supply chains, 400 people die every year to satisfy our consumption of, of textile products. And more than 20,000 people are injured at work for satisfying this consumption. And so in the same way this year, we have looked at the food um, supply chains and look at um, uh, specific impacts that are generated through this uh, supply chain. So every year, the EU imports about 145 million tons of agricult agricult agricultural products. And what the study shows is that um, there's negative impacts through the, the food supply chains, which are very significant, right? So around 40 to 60% of the impacts in terms of CO2 emissions, SO2, air pollution, NOx, and land use, um, happen outside of um, the EU. And so those generate climate change impacts, biodiversity threats, soil erosion, water acidification, and air pollution um, abroad. And what the study does also is to look more precisely at specific food commodities, so crop growing, meat and fish products, livestock um, farming, and so on. Um, of what are driving those negative uh, impacts, but also which countries are being impacted. And that's really the strength of those multi-regional um, input-output models is that you can map also uh, which countries more specifically are, are being impacted. So I won't spend too much time on this because Arunima will walk you through the detailed um, results in a, in a second. Um, but in terms of, let's say, policy um, conclusion um, and and um, and what, what the EU can do to address those spillovers. I guess the, the study and our work um, identifies sort of, sort of four main levers to address those spillovers and, and strengthen policy coherence in the, in the EU. So the first one is around financing um, the SDGs uh, globally. Um, so through COVID, uh, rich countries were able to finance recovery plans and you know, the EU um, has obviously mobilized a lot of funding for an inclusive and, and green recovery, but obviously fiscal space is much more limited in low income countries and many countries around the world. And so this question of financing was identified by the UN Secretary General as the number two priority for 2022 after um, taking actions to, to, to eradicate COVID-19 in his uh, message to the General Assembly in January 2022. So, the question of financing is very important. Rich countries fell short of their promise to dedicate $100 billion um, dollars for um, climate uh, finance. And so the question on how do we channel um, resources to um, support SDG transformations in developing countries is really um, an important aspect of those um, spillover um, effects. The second one is around SDG Green Deal um, diplomacy including the transfer of knowledge and technologies, development cooperation, bilateral relationships, how all of this can be mobilized um, to support um, actions uh, around the world in cleaning up um, supply chains, but also EU's role in international fora like the G20, the G7, ANGA, HLPF, and other, and other forums. Domestic reforms can obviously play a role and there's discussions on the due diligence regulation, um, you know, questions around um, diets, the border adjustment mechanisms. Um, Although some of those measures, especially the border adjustment mechanisms, might be perceived as um, being protectionist measures from the rest of the world, and as um, a way to deny the right to development of certain countries. So that's why we, we emphasize in the study the need to complement those border adjustment mechanisms with efforts on international financing and uh, diplomacy. Um, and so, the other, the other aspect to this is robust data and monitoring systems, which was mentioned also by Dr. Dietrich. I think here there's obviously, you know, as the EU is moving towards a due diligence regulation, it's very important that there's the right monitoring framework that is put in place to track um, actions and impacts of companies throughout the full supply chain. It's a key element of enforcement. At the country level, we've been um, uh, advocating and supporting the integration of spillover data and consumption-based metrics into um, official um, uh, statistics. And in terms of reporting to the UN, um, it, it's good to see that a country like Finland in its voluntary national review has integrated this issue of consumption-based and, and spillovers in its uh, voluntary national review. And as the EU is working 
you know, possibly to, to uh, present an EU-wide VNR um, at, the, at the UN, um, it will be important that this issue of international spillovers be part of this EU uh, VNR. And so on this issue of due diligence and specifically our work on, on food companies, we published at, the, at SDSN and working with other partners, a framework for aligning the, the, the reporting of companies to the, to the SDGs. Um, looking at the products that are put into the market, the sustainable, um, the internal processes and, and value chains, um, issues around uh, good corporate citizenship, um, which hopefully can help um, improve and align uh, corporate reporting and actions with the, with the SDGs. And, not to spend too much time on this, this is this is detailed in the study, but also in a report that was a separate report which was published in, in December. But there are detailed, um, let's say, interventions and metrics that are listed um, to guide um, the reporting of uh, food companies and align it with the um, sustainable development goals. So I will stop here and hand it over to um, Arunima, who will walk you through uh, the methods and um, the, the key findings of the, of the study. Aurima, over to you. Uh, thank you, Guillaume. Uh, and thanks to SDSN, GIZ, and BMZ um, for recognizing the importance and the need for quantifying international spillover impacts and for supporting this important work. Uh, thanks also, in particular, to my co-authors, um, Guillaume, um, Selma, Zach, and colleagues at the University of Sydney, and also in particular to GIZ, um, Nina and Barbara for again um, uh, supporting uh, and initiating uh, this work. So I'll share my screen and I will walk us through uh, the key methodologies that we've used and the results that have come out from this assessment. So essentially, as Guillaume mentioned, uh, the aim of the study was to quantify international spillover impacts. And we addressed this by looking at upstream supply chains. So just as a way of illustrating, let's say you have the EU uh, and the demand for EU in terms of a range of food products, be it primary products, uh, fruits, vegetables, or processed food, whether it's meat, uh, cakes, um, and other processed food, bread, cheese, dairy products. We wanted to track the various kinds of food products uh, that, that the EU sort of has demand for uh, and trace their international supply chains to see where exactly are these impacts taking place in, in the world. So for this, we needed to use a multi-regional input-output uh, analysis, which is a technique that Guillaume uh, mentioned, allows us to scan impacts internationally and also to look at the imports and exports. So for example, if we have the EU um, uh, getting imports from a range of countries, um, then where exactly are those impacts taking place? Now, when I talk about impacts, we need to drill down and really specify what kind of impacts I'm interested in quantifying. So for this study, we decided to look at a range of social indicators, environmental indicators, and economic, which linked with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So for the social, we had employment. Uh, for environmental, we had carbon dioxide, air pollutants, land. Uh, for economic, we had income. For air pollutants, we had um, nitrogen oxide, we had sulfur dioxide and particulate matter. So we wanted to capture a range of environmental impacts in terms of EU's demand for food. The methodology that we used for quantifying such impacts relied on um, taking into account the, the custom built functionality of this industrial ecology virtual laboratory platform that we've developed in collaboration with a range of universities. Uh, this platform essentially allows us to look at a range of data sets and construct a customized global international uh, trade model that we can use for our specific research question. So just uh, as a way of um, illustrating what kinds of different IE labs, we call them IE labs. So what kind of different IE labs are there around the world? So we have IE lab global, that enables uh, construction uh, and, and quantification of impacts in, in terms of international spillovers from a country perspective. So different countries, how they're importing, exporting, coupling information about imports and exports. 
um, and quantifying impacts. We have IE Lab Australia, which provides a subnational model. So that's subnational detail for IE Lab Australia. And similarly, we have IE Lab China, Indonesia, Japan, Sweden, Taiwan, and US all giving subnational detail within these countries. For this specific case study, because we were interested in looking at international spillover impacts, we used IE Lab Global, or we also call this the Global MRIO Lab. The Global MRIO Lab has information for 2,201 countries. And for each of those countries, we can select sectors for construction of a customized global international trade model from a selection of 6,357 sectors. So more than 6,000 sectors in, in um, 221 countries. And we can use this for constructing a model that can be used for scanning upstream supply chains. So for example, um, demand for specific um, crops, uh, demand for soybeans, for example, in, in the EU, where exactly are these um, soybeans being produced and really scanning those upstream to pinpoint where the hotspots are of these impacts. And by impacts, we looked at employment, income, uh, carbon dioxide, air pollutants, and land. So this is a, a, an illustration or a schematic uh, or a heat map, as we call, uh, of a, a multi-regional input output table as it looks like. It's essentially a matrix or a, a, um, a range of matrices that come together to form an input output system. For supply chain modeling, of course, we need information on regions and, and sectors in the rows and regions and sectors in the columns, which is uh, really um, the core of how we are able to trace these international spillover impacts. Because ultimately, we need a way for figuring out where exactly are these commodities produced around the world that are ultimately imported by various EU nations. So we, we looked at EU um, uh, related impacts for all individual EU states. So where exactly are these commodities produced and what are the different impacts that are happening around the world? So uh, key results that we uh, sort of found from this study, and I'll walk us through the different components of this diagram. So in this radial, we have uh, 5%, 10, 20, and 50. And you can see that we have the colors sort of uh, broken down by various bands. So there are three bands uh, in each sort of uh, a radial for every indicator. So land, SO2, so these environmental indicators, social and economic. These bands at the middle specify the direct impacts. So impacts happening directly in, in, in EU for production and consumption. So in addition to uh, sort of capturing sp international spillover impacts, we also quantified impacts resulting within EU for domestic production and consumption. So direct impacts, first order impacts. So who are these immediate suppliers uh, of, of these uh, food producing sectors and supply chain impacts. So we looked at the entire supply chain and we scanned it, the supply chain uh, by different layers of production in that supply chain tree that I demonstrated in my second slide, where you start off with the demand uh, for certain food commodities and you make your way up as you scan suppliers, suppliers of suppliers and so on. And you can do this at a sector level to see what sectors uh, there are in the supply chain where hotspots are taking place. And you can also scan by region to really understand where exactly uh, are these impacts taking place in terms of the geographic location of the impacts? So sectoral information, as well as, well as regional information uh, in terms of the impacts. So we see that there are range, uh, for, uh, you know, range of indicators. You have direct impacts. You also have first order and supply chain impacts. So really only looking at the direct would, re would result in us missing on this important information about these hotspots that are hidden in the supply chain. Another information that this diagram is trying to communicate is this information about intra-EU related impacts and the rest of the world. So contribution uh, of domestic production and imports to the overall uh, consumption-based footprint of EU's demand for food products. 
So intra-EU, for example, uh, shows trade between different EU nations. So that could be, for example, Netherlands and Germany, uh, trade between those, whether it be vegetables, dairy products, bakery products, seeds, and other agricultural related products. So essentially different EU nations producing commodities and trading within the EU. So that's what we are capturing here in the intra-EU trade. In the rest of the world, we are capturing the spillover impacts. So these are your impacts that take place outside of the EU for satisfying EU's consumption of food products. So that could be trade between Brazil and the EU where the soybeans or coffee is produced in Brazil. So impacts are taking place in Brazil, for example, or um, in Mexico, if we have Mexico trading with the EU or some of the Asian economies, uh, impacts are taking place outside of the EU for production of goods and, and services. Uh, and th the final consumption is taking place in the EU. So this sort of varies with different indicators. So you can see that for some of the indicators, it's, it's roughly 50-50 in terms of the consumption-based impacts, whether it's domestic uh, production uh, or, uh, and consumption, or whether it's reliance on imports that is leading to spillover impacts in different parts of the world. So unraveling the supply chains of the rest of the world, that is what we really were interested in this study. So understanding where exactly outside of the, of the EU are these international spillover impacts taking place. So in terms of the impacts that are taking place outside of the EU, we considered the rest of the world portion um, of production that is needed to support EU's consumption or demand for food products. And we captured a range of food products. So primary uh, food products and also processed food. So for satisfying um, or meeting the demand of, of EU's consumption, where exactly are these uh, products being produced and what are the associated impacts? So we have three indicators on this slide for illustration. Uh, we have CO2 emissions, land and PM. Uh, on the X axis, so the horizontal axis, represents the different layers of production. And by production layer, we are essentially, essentially trying to cover uh, the supply chain aspect, uh, that, that you have um, a, a demand for a certain commodity, that demand, for meeting that demand, you need inputs from other sectors of the economy, whether they are produced in a certain region uh, or a range of different regions of the world. And then you have um, sectors uh, in turn needing to interact with other global sectors and global regions to be able to produce that uh, commodity. So if you have a demand for a processed food product, then you, you, have, you would have a supply chain that sort of starts off with primary production, uh, which then uh, is then sent off to maybe another sector or industry for adding value to it or, or um, processing um, of meat, for example, and then ultimately to the final consumer. So upstream supply chain impacts in terms of uh, the regions and the sectors. So this particular slide shows the regional perspective and we have the different countries uh, sort of um, aggregated into the regions. So we had a range of countries in our input output table uh, one, about 164. And for the ease of illustration, we've aggregated those into broad regions. And as we can see uh, that the Asia Pacific sort of stands out for CO2 emissions and, and PM related impacts. We have um, Africa, for example, and a range of other countries, Latin America, uh, that stand out for land use related impacts. We also have Latin America standing out for PM related impacts. So really trying to understand for these different indicators, whether it be environmental or PM, which ultimately also have health related uh, impacts uh, in, these, in these countries, we wanted to capture what are the environmental implications and what are the social implications in terms of uh, these commodities that are being produced, with, produced for satisfying EU's demand for food products. So uh, really the core of this diagram is unraveling this supply chain, uh, which starts off with the demand for a range of food products, uh, primary uh, and secondary, and looking at the supply chain perspective and drilling down deeper to see where exactly are these impacts taking place. 
So if, you, if we wish, wish to sort of drill down uh, from a broad region level to a country level, then we can see that EU's international food related you know, trade links, they pretty much originate in countries worldwide. And we only have the top links shown in this diagram. So we have, again, um, CO2 emissions, land, and uh, PM related impacts. Within EU, of course, we have our intra-EU trade, where a country produces um, goods, and goods related to the food sector, which are then consumed within the EU. And we also have impacts taking place in the rest of the world, which we consider all other parts of the world apart from the EU. So impacts are not just concentrated in the food sectors, and this is an important point to note. Um, it's, it's not just the food sector, if we're considering this study to be about international supply chains uh, and the spillover impacts for food, for the demand for food, but it's also broadly across a range of sectors in the supply chain. And that's largely because the food sectors, they require inputs from other sectors of the economy. So processing of meat, for example, requires input of electricity, so, so that even though the final demand uh, is for the meat products, in the supply chain for that meat products, we would have electricity featuring. And how is that electricity produced, whether it's fossil fuel based or whether it's renewable um, source based? Uh, again, if it's fossil fuel based, then it, has, it carries a greater environmental impact. So all that needs to be considered in the final consumption of a particular uh, commodity. So it's really important to note that at a sector level, the impacts are not just concentrated for the food sectors, but also in the supply chains for electricity, for example, which shows up here as red. Uh, agriculture here is, is green, but it's also in the transport sector, for example. So transportation is also a key sort of a driver uh, in terms of the impacts that take place for satisfying uh, demand for food products. Again, if we uh, consider what exactly is traded uh, with the countries worldwide or imported into EU for satisfying um, the demand uh, or, the, or meeting the, the final uh, consumption of the EU. We have a range of products and I've only really highlighted um, some key ones, ones here. Um, we, we have fruits, nuts, spices, we have soybean, oil cakes, um, coffee, oil cakes, we have made products, vegetables from, from all around or, um, the world essentially, uh, where it's where the impacts are taking place in various proportions. In some some countries are fa facing uh, far greater impacts um, than others. Uh, ultimately, uh, for producing um, imports uh, for for uh, that go into EU. I would just like to finish off um, by picking up on the points. Um, um, that have been made uh, so far. So of course we know uh, that disasters uh, have uh, quite a big impact on, on food security. And we, we have quantified this for COVID-19 and um, the current situation in, in Russia and Ukraine would have a, a far greater impact, of course. So with COVID, with the quantification that we've done, we know that livelihoods are impacted. So this diagram is taken from a study where we looked at the environmental, social, and economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and how there have been income losses um, from industries shutting down. So if we have a manufacturing industry that sh shuts down, and if that is part of a supply chain um, for a particular commodity that, uh, that consumers uh, have a demand for, then of course, supply chain disruptions, they lead to uh, uh, impacts that sort of span beyond uh, one indicator. So it could be employment losses or it could be uh, jobs and, and livelihoods going down from these disasters. So really there are bro broader implications for a spillover assessment. Um, so we need to address these impacts. Uh, and as Hugh mentioned as well in his talk at, at the level of EU leadership, uh, we look, need to look at the companies, consumers, but we also need to look at um, the data sets uh, and making them more robust to be able to quantify these impacts at, at a further local scale. Um, so in, in addition to drilling down to certain countries, we should also be able to drill down to certain regions within those countries. And that is where some of the research in the development of nested international trade models could come into play, where you have 
a certain region uh, in in uh, Brazil, for example, re uh, really uh, we're able to pick that up in terms of how that certain region in Brazil or certain region in Australia or China or US how it trades with, with the EU or other countries and where exactly uh, in, in, that, in that region impacts are taking place. So there is still much work to be done in this space for quantification of international spillover impacts. And that is where I'll leave. If you're interested in reading more about the study uh, and um, the results in detail, it is available online. Thank you. All right, well, thank you to both panelists for some excellent presentations with lots of good details uh, about the overview of the work in this area, as well as how complicated and technically challenging it is to track these spillovers. We do have some time for some questions and answers. So if you will open up the Q&A box and drop your questions in there, we'll see how far we can get into these. And we'll go ahead and start with a couple of questions that seem to be related thematically from Bettina Rudloff from the Trade and Agricultural Expert at the Institute for International and Security Affairs. Uh, the first question talks about how uh, these results could feed into existing uh, subsidies tools at the OECD and the World Trade Organization. And perhaps as a companion question to that, how these tools could also feed into EU initiatives on avoiding uh, deforestation. So, um, Guillaume, perhaps you could uh, lead off and maybe address where you see these kinds of tools plugging into existing policy efforts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Zach. And, you know, I think, so Ahunima has shared results which come from the IE Lab um, model and, and work. So I'll let her also describe um, how this connects and how that might be different to, to other work that is ongoing. But there's obviously phenomenal work that's being conducted in, in many institutions, including at the WTO um, at the OECD. I would also say the Joint Research uh, Center of the European um, Commission, where there's actually a whole platform now looking at those issues. So I would say that this, this topic of, of international spillovers, and in particular of measuring and tracking um, consumption-based impacts, has picked up um, a, a lot over the past um, couple of years. And I think more and more, uh, and just to, 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 to build on what Aurima was saying, I think it's you know, going more and more granular at looking at specific supply chains, commodities, um, but also you know, within countries where those impacts are happening. Um, and at the end of the day, a lot of the, the efforts to clean up those supply chains happen industry um, by industry. There's you know, governance processes for each uh, industry. And so the more we can document the impact of specific um, supply chains and sectors, the, the better it is. And one of the great value of the, the IE Lab is this ability to actually map uh, bilateral interactions between EU's consumption and specific individual countries that are be, being impacted. That's one of the difference with other databases, which might have a bigger rest of the world category where you, know, you need to, these are assessed in terms of, of, of regions and less country by, by country. Um, but I let Aurima complement on this. On the question around um, deforestation um, and how this links also to some of the processes going on in the EU, I mean, that's precisely what we're trying to do here with those, with those studies is to, to feed into the, those processes to inform um, some of the reforms that are that are being uh, done, we know that when we released the study back in 2020 on the textile supply chains, there was um, some interest from the European Commission and the team working on due diligence um, to uh, with these numbers. Now, the 400 people um, dying every year for satisfying consumption of textile and the, the accidents at work happening in the supply chain. So, by putting precise numbers, we feel it makes those issues even more um, tangible and concrete. And on deforestation, um, so we know that, and that's according to WWF, that the EU is responsible for around 16% of tropical deforestation globally. So that's not our number, that's the number for WWF. In this study, the proxy that we used um, is uh, land use. Um, and um, in the Global Common Stewardship Index, we there is an indicator related to land use biodiversity uh, loss. Um, and we are doing work at SDSN, working with many partners to strengthen our ability to track precisely um, those uh, impacts generated on, on deforestation. 
if I can just take one more question, because I saw there was an important question also on small uh, farmers as well, uh, and then I'll hand it over to Abunba to complement. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I think, especially, uh, you know, the issue of small um, uh, smallholder farmers and also small and medium companies came up quite strongly in the debates and the discussions around the due diligence um, regulation. It was a major point where there were, um, you know, a number of, of, of challenges um, because obviously the point is to balance the need for reporting, um, including across the supply chain and so on, but also balance it with um, not creating, um, you know, burdens that are um, that are too high, especially for small uh, companies. So I think that there, there is obviously a need to accompany uh, smallholder farmers and, and smaller companies, including financially. And that was a big point, by the way, of our food and land chapter in our European report, which came out in, in December. But at the same time, there's also a need and you know, building on some of our results from, from, from studies that we've done, there's also a need to, to strengthen the indicator framework and, and track a bit more at the company level what's what's going on. So we did a study um, at this DSN working with the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment, specifically on the 100 largest food companies in 2021. And we saw that there's major gaps in companies, commitments, measures, and contributions to the, the transition towards uh, sustainable food systems. 5% of the company's surveys were actually disclosing targets, years, um, and timelines for sustainable management of the supply chain in their sustainability reports. And 10% only of the companies had KPIs to monitor deforestation and uh, disqualify supplier for not um, non-compliance with basic sustainability criteria. So it's just to say that looking at those big companies, there's a lot of room to improve when it comes to um, you know, robust reporting and monitoring of those um, impacts throughout um, the entire um, supply chains. Thank you, excellent response. Uh, Dr. Malik, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, thanks, Zach. Thanks, Guillaume. Um, I echo um, what Guillaume said. There is excellent work be being done um, by um, the JRC, also Eurostat, um, European Environmental Agency. There are research groups in Norway as well who are working on multi-regional um, input output analysis, um, yielding um, these, these uh, research outcomes that are being used uh, in, in a range of different formats. Uh, maybe I can pick up um, on the point that you made about companies and also um, add to that um, the point that consumers need to be taken on board as well. And as a small success story of how some of these findings um, uh, are being used uh, at a local level, because of course we need to act uh, not just nationally, but also uh, in, in our local councils as well. So uh, a success story that I can, I can share on that um, is um, a study that we did uh, for a local council uh, where we quantified such impacts in terms of the demand uh, for food products, for textile products, and a range of other commodities. Um, and that uh, report was used for informing their sustainability strategy. So of course, uh, these consumption-based uh, accounting measures or these quantifications um, that are being performed uh, by a, a range of organizations and also with the IE Lab uh, platform. So I saw there was a question uh, specifically asking whether we did these calculations in MATLAB and what was the software that was being used. Um, so we did use MATLAB for performing these calculations, uh, specifically with the IE Lab uh, platform. And there are other multi-regional input-output databases um, that research groups, prominent research groups, have, have constructed around the world. Um, so there are EORA, Exiobase, WIOD, so a range of multi-regional input-output databases, and also we have um, this IE Lab platform now that sort of brings together this capability of constructing customized multi-regional input-output um, tables. So of course, um, uh, there's work that needs to be done in the research space, as always there is, uh, but there are um, small success stories uh, where we can see some of these findings being used uh, at a local level uh, and also at a state level for informing sustainability strategies, um, whether it be uh, for an entire council or whether it be for a sector, for example. So at a state level, um, I've seen some of these findings feature uh, in their um, sustainability plans um, or a reporting statement. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, um, a step in the right direction in terms of um, the implementation of the findings that come out of these models. Excellent. Thank you so much. 
Uh, we have lots of interest, but unfortunately we're running short on time. Uh, thanks to all of you who've submitted questions. If you would like to have some follow-up with those, please feel free to email us at info at sdgindex.org. And we'll get back to you as soon as we can with uh, you know, answering these pressing issues that you have in order to incorporate this into your work. Uh, I'd like to extend a thanks also to the panelists for participating in this um, seminar and, and giving us excellent presentations and uh, richer context in this Q&A session. So you will uh, receive a satisfaction survey. Uh, please fill it out and send it back to us. Your opinion counts. It allows us to improve our online events, make them more responsive and useful to the audience that we have. Uh, Salma, would you like to uh, conclude with some additional remarks on our work? Yes. Thank you, Zach. Um, I would just like uh, to thank you all again and uh, let you know that this study was actually the second study of uh, uh, this partnership. The first one tackled social spillovers. Um, and I can just drop the link on the chat. And uh, this um, previous study uh, was particularly interested in EU's text textile supply chains and uh, accidents at work. Next year, uh, so at next year, at the end of the year 2022, we are expecting also to launch another, a new e, uh, article uh, that will be more interesting, more interested in mineral supply chains in the European Union, tackling another social spillover, modern slavery, uh, and also our uh, sustainable development report that also takes into account spillovers will, will be coming out in June this year. Thank you again uh, for your participation and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>